Hello everybody, my name is Mohit Desponde, and uh, in, in this video, I want to take our model of a biological neuron and then model it more formally using uh, mathematics into what we call a perceptron. And so if you, look, if you remember at this picture, we kind of had, um, let me go back to the picture. So if you remember, w with this picture, we had these biological neurons. And like I said, there are kind of three big portions of this. There are the dendrites which were different inputs from other neurons, and we could have any number of inputs from other neurons. And then we had the, the nucleus, which does some kind of you know, processing task, and has to consider all of, the, uh, all of the neurons, and then all the input neurons, I should say, and then it produces some output. And so we can model that uh, mathematically into something called a perceptron. And so... I'm going to kind of draw a big circle here, and that's going to kind of represent our cell body kind of thing with this perceptron. It kind of represents this. Uh, and so there's kind of two portions of this. And so first, let's kind of go from, well, let's go from left to right, naturally. So you remember with the biological neuron, we have inputs from other neurons through these dendrites. And so, you know, suppose we have some uh, um, input here. So suppose that this is connected with, um, let's say it's connected with four other neurons. Let's just kind of start with small. So I'm going to call my inputs x, x1, x2, x3, and x4. And so these are, you know, the four other neurons that this one happens to be connected to. And so then, you know, in here, there's actually, there's something inside there called a, a synapse. Um, so they're not... It, and it's kind of like a transfer of neurotransmitters, but again, I'm not going to talk too much about that. But basically what the synapse gives us is, suppose here's my synapse that I'm going to denote with a little circle. Synapse gives us little weights, and we call them weights. So here's W1, here's weight 2. Actually, here, I, have, I have a better idea. Let, let me do these in, in color. So here is weight 1, weight 2. Weight three and weight four. So now that I have these weights, um, it, we we model this with a multiplicative interaction. So what I mean by that is, and what actually goes into this neuron is is actually x one, x two, x three, x four. Each of these times that respective weight. So it's going to be x one, w one x2, w2, x3 times w3, and then x4 times w4. So these are the actual inputs that go into our um, into our neuron or into our perceptron. And, and so this is kind of models the um, this kind of models this side here with these dendrites. And so now we actually have to do something with uh, with the nucleus. And actually, just to make this point clear, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put these in a different color again. So this will then be x1, w1, be x2, w2, we'll have x3, w3, and then x4, w4. And so when I get these different inputs, kind of a, a natural thing to do would be to take the sum of all of these inputs. And so what's really input into this neuron uh, is going to be x1, w1, plus x2, w2, plus x3, w3, plus x4, w4. And there's kind of one extra little term that, that's added, and that's plus b. And this b is called the bias. And this is just you know a different term. Uh, that we add into our model, and it turns out that it, it works really well. And and so, because you remember that all, with all these weights, these weights are the things that we're actually learning. X is just the inputs, and so the weights are what we what we want to learn. But because each of these are multiplied by a um, by by an input, we want to have one other parameter that's kind of independent of all of the inputs, so to speak. And that's the bias because we don't multiply by any of the inputs, and so this kind of serves as like a global um, like a global term across all of the um, across these these weights inputs. So if this produces a certain value that's kind of all off by five or something, I can just change my bias to five or minus five, and then you know adjust this 
full thing. So just kind of like another additional adjustment parameter. And actually, I can represent this more succinctly using a summation notation. So I can do sum i x sub i w sub i and then plus a bias. So the bias isn't actually in this sum. It's just kind of an extra, an extra thing. So this is just a more concise way of representing this sum. I don't want to, have to write this out all the time. But I can just write this. And so that's kind of one of the big portions of our um, of, of our network is when I take all these inputs, I, I take the sum of them. And so uh, what I end up with is the sum over i of x i w i plus the bias b. And so this is what happens when I take my inputs, and you know each input here is weighted by some uh, weight w. And so then what we do is inside we, we take the sum of all of these, and then we get, you notice when we take the sum, we, we basically get a value. You know, we just get a, a value or, you know, in, depending on how you think about this, you can also, you get, you get a vector back, um, but depending on what these inputs are, but right. So, so when you get these inputs, you take this thing and it's called a weighted sum and then you add a bias. And then there's one extra thing that we have to do. Remember. Uh, I mentioned that there's some other processing that we have to do, and that is we have to decide whether or not this perceptron or this neuron actually, you know, fires, quote unquote, and you know we have to also decide what value do we actually fire because the output of this is going to be the input into some other perceptron if we have this, you know, like layered, uh, for example, which we will. And so the question is, how do we take this input and like how, what 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 do we do with it basically? And so usually what we do is we kind of cut this a little bit, we cut this up and we have a, we usually have some function um, that I'm going to call g. We have some function g and g actually produces the output. So remember that the perceptron takes in, or any neuron really, takes in a single, uh, takes in it, you know, or actually it, it outputs a single value. And it takes in any number of inputs, but the output's always just kind of one thing. And, but then these one things can go into any number of different perceptrons, and it's just really the same value that's kind of the input. So if I had more perceptrons over here, this G would then go all the way over to, you know, this, the output of this perceptron would go into all of them. But G is just some function that we apply to this that decides what output we get. So, and G is interchangeable, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the values. So then we apply, when we take this weighted sum, then we apply G to it. So G is this. We apply g of the weighted sum x i w i plus b, and then g outputs some value, and that's the value that we give to any other perceptrons that happen to be one layer deeper than than this. And uh, so g is what we call an activation function. So g is an activation function. So activation. Function. It's also called a nonlinearity. Well, the nonlinearity because G is usually a nonlinear function because um, the reason that kind of the, the reason that G is a, a not a linear function is because we might want to model things that are not linear, and so we can't model things that are not linear by taking the linear combination of a ton of linear things. So, you know, if you do that, then the output is linear. So you need to add some nonlinearity so that when you apply them, you can get, you can actually produce something that's nonlinear. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but there are all sorts of different kind of options for this. And actually, there's still people inventing um, activation functions. Like, there's some recent activation functions that people have been inventing. But, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds. There's a sigmoid, which kind of was one of the first ones, but then we kind of moved away from it because there, it had some issues. Uh, there's tan h, which is hyperbolic tangent. There is probably one of the the better ones is a uh, relu, or rectified linear unit, um, and there is a kind of a variant of that called a leaky relu. So leaky relu that tries to address some of the issues with the orig original relu, um, and then probably one of the more simplest ones is you know there's just like a there's like a step function. For example, you know, and, and there's so many more different kinds of, of activation functions. And 
it's really just kind of picking one, seeing if it works well. If it doesn't, then maybe try something else. I will say that uh, relus tend to work really well, uh, and so I, w I would recommend that you that you look at that. Sigmoid is probably something to avoid, uh, unless you have unless you're using it for like an output, or you're you know doing something very specific with that. But internally for perceptrons, you kind of want to avoid sigmoid. Um, relu or leaky relu is works well. There are others, uh, of course, that work well, and people, like I said, people are inventing these all the time. Uh, anyway, that is really our model of our, um, that is the kind of the model of our perceptron. That's just kind of a single perceptron. And so uh, uh, what we're going to be doing, I'm going to do a quick recap, but, but what we're going to be doing is seeing what happens when we, uh, we're going to use an example um, with these perceptrons. We're going to kind of go through an example of, of how we would use them and um, we'll see, you know, much later on what happens when you, if we, we're just dealing with one perceptron, what happens when you stack them together? Or what happens when you have them in layers? Or how many layers should I have? How many perceptrons should I have in each layer? Well, we will answer all these questions. Uh, so I'll just do a quick recap. So the perceptron is supposed to be one of the simplest models of a biological neuron. And so uh, what it does is we basically, our, our inputs are x1, x2, x3, x4, we can have any number of inputs. But each input is multiplied by a corresponding weight, w1, w2, and, and so on. And so then the actual input to this is then x1, w1, x2, w2, x3, w3, and, and so on. So what we do with that is we take the sum of all those. So you get x1, w1, plus x2, w2, plus x3, w3, plus so on and so on. And then we can add in this additional term called a, a bias. And the bias is, is added because it tends to work out better. And it's good because it's not tied to a particular uh, input, which is, which is also nice. It, it's going to you know, help out. Uh, but after we have this weighted, it's called a weighted sum, uh, then we actually have to figure out what output we want to produce. And to figure that out, we use g, which is an activation function. So we apply g to this weighted sum here, and we can produce you know, and we can produce an output. And I guess I should, I can use some shorthand here in the sense that this is usually like Z. And so, you know, when we, this is actually just going to be G of Z that we apply and then we get an output A, which is an activation. And so that's just kind of a shorthand notation that I'll be using kind of going forward. Um, but yeah, so this is a perceptron. Model NG is just an activation function or a nonlinearity. It's also called that. And, uh, you know, there's a lots of different examples that you can pick for that. Probably the simplest, the step function. We're going to be looking at that um, in, in the future. And so uh, I'm going to stop right here. But we're, in case you don't fully understand this, because this is kind of all, uh, this is a little abstract. We're, let's actually take this idea of a perceptron and let's use this in a more concrete example.